As you drive along many of Berrien County's roads, some paved but mostly dirt, you may not realize you are passing through one of Berrien County's ghost towns. Few have any physical remains of the once thriving community, but they are ghost towns just the same. They once had 50 or 100 residents, a commercial establishment or two, a school, a church, and sometimes a cemetery. Several had a post office or a telegraph, many a flag stop on one of the four railroad lines crossing through the county. But usually something happened in the lives of these residents or in their business fortunes, or in the world around them, and slowly their history was left behind and soon forgotten. Oh, the names are still there, in part or whole. Allendale, Lois, Glory, Bannockburn, Gladys, Weber, Connell, Rotown, Baker Sawmill, and others. Each has its own story to tell, so come on along with me and visit a few ghost towns of Berrien. As you are traveling south toward Ray City on Highway 129, a sign alerts you that you are approaching the Allenville community. However, when you reach the crossroad of the Allenville Road and 129, very little would suggest that this was once an active business and residential area. To the left, across the railroad tracks, is the Allenville Community Center, built in the 1950s. If you turn and cross the tracks, there is a pecan orchard on the right adjacent to the tracks. This was the location of the business section of Old Allenville. On this 1908 map of Berrien County, before Highway 129 was built in the 1930s, the road from Ray City to Nashville was called the Nashville Mill Town or Ray's Mill Road. Heading north from Ray City, it took a hard turn westward, then continued northward, connecting with what is Garner Road today. Fetchville might have been more an appropriate name if you look back to the early landowner in 1843, John M. Futch, brother of pioneer Reuben Futch. The community occupied almost all of land lot 329 of the 10th district. Then in December 1859, the ninth child of Mr. and Mrs. John M. Futch was born, a baby girl named Rachel Virginia Futch. Rachel grew up in the area where she would call home the rest of her life. Eighteen years later, in December of 1877, Rachel Futch married William B. Allen, age 20, son of Civil War widow Rachel Allen Shaw. The couple lived in a log home on what was called the Duran Place, and soon William Allen owned several hundred acres. Over the next several years, Big Bill Allen, known for his stout stature, accumulated large tracts of land and was an astute businessman. He was one of the original founders of the Farmers and Merchants Bank in Nashville. Though on each U.S. Census he listed his occupation as farmer, he anticipated the coming of the railroad through his property and built a sawmill, commissary, and boarding house adjacent to the east side of the railroad tracks. Thus the community became Allenville 
as it was called on all the railroad time schedules. The Georgia and Florida Railroad placed tracks between Nashville and Ray City in 1908 with whistle stops at Allenville to load up on wood from the Allenville Mill. Flag stops provided passenger service which provided some business to the little community. The school in Allenville was called Pleasant Vale. It was situated on the west bank of Cat Creek. The first year of operation was 1896, with C.A. Devane as the teacher, but quickly replaced by William Green Avra. Of course, many of the students were from Bill and Rachel Allen's families. Their daughter, Lily Allen, also taught at Pleasant Vale for several years after she reached the eighth grade at the school. There are no known photos of the school or any class photos. The school was a one or two room school, which was remarkable, as during its last year of operation in 1935, it was reported that 87 students had attended, seven of which were black. When the school closed, Pleasant Vale students then attended school in Ray City and the old Pleasant Vale school was then dismantled for lumber. About 1910, William built the home on Allenville Road west of Highway 129. That home still stands today. By that time, all but four of his nine children had either passed away or were married and had families of their own. Marcus L. Allen, his oldest son, was living with his wife and children in the home near the tracks which his parents had vacated. He eventually became a police chief in Nashville. His oldest daughter, Rosetta, had married John W. Weaver and they purchased a portion of the Allen estate on the west side of Cat Creek. Over the next decade, Allenville was at its height of activity with the growth of the Allen clan as well as new adjoining neighbors. Large crowds of family members gathered with their Fudge and Allen kin for Sunday picnics. Other families that helped Allenville grow were the Mays, Carters, Spells, Brantleys, Gaskins and Skinners, and others. William B. Allen died from complications of diabetes in April 1924, and with him, much of old Allenville died as well. The railroad no longer stopped for wood. The sawmill was forced out of business by the Clements Brothers Sawmill in Ray City and the boarding house was torn down or burned, nobody remembers which. Edgar Allen, William and Rachel's youngest son, married many vicars in 1928, and the couple moved into the home with Rachel to care for her until she passed away in 1937. In the last photograph gathering of the Allen children, only these six of the survivors were present. Letha Patton, Rosa Weaver, Lily Young, Edgar Allen, Tommy Allen, and Willie Allen. Edgar and Minnie Allen lived in the old home place through the rest of their lives, leaving it to their only child, Sandra, upon their passing. Today, Highway 129 passes it by, and few, if any, can recall when old Allenville was more than just a crossroads sign and one of Berrien County's ghost towns. <laughs>
four miles east of Alapaha. There are three entrances to Glory Main Street, but all roads lead to Glory. All the roads are as they were 100 years ago, unpaved, but we will enter on the road named for its destination, Glory Road. We pass through an arbor lane, arriving at a T intersection named Lila B. Gaskins Road on today's signposts. This was the main street of the Glory community. Actually, the community known as Glory was first called Rosendale, as shown on this 1883 Clem Company map. It probably did not acquire the Glory moniker until after the Brunswick and Western Railroad was sold to the plant system in 1888. The Atlantic Coastline Railroad purchased the tracks in 1902. The earliest map with Glory identified was in this 1905 Rand McNally map. However, in Jim Fort's Postal History, a post office called Glory was established in 1899, possibly in a commissary, and remained in operation until it was discontinued in 1910. The community of Glory next appears on the 1908 Hudgens Company map of Berrien County with two commercial entities named in the town site. R.O. Carter was operating a mill on the north side of the Atlantic Coast Line tracks, most likely a sawmill. Just east of his operation on the south side of the tracks was the Sears Turpentine Still. R.O. Carter was 49-year-old Redden Oscar Carter who was living in a very nice home in Tifton with his wife and four daughters. The 1910 census indicates he was in the naval stores business, possibly with an agreement with the Sears still to mill their lumber. The Sears company was most likely operated by 33-year-old Hiram F. Sears, shown here in a later photo. He was living in Pearson with his mother, his wife, and their six children, including a set of twins. His census record indicates he owned and operated a turpentine still and sawmill. It appears that both Carter and Sears may have had some incentive to operate businesses that required their absence some distance from their homes. How long they operated their business in glory is not known. However, by 1930, both the still and sawmill, plus a commissary, were owned by John H. Henderson. Henderson brought his young family to live at a home on the still site, on the south side of the ACL tracks. He lived among the houses of most of his black steel workers and operated a commissary on the north side of the tracks for his workers and town folk. He was still operating the still and sawmill in 1940 with the aid of G.W. Woot Sizemore until Sizemore died in 1944. One other still operated in the Glory area known as the Corbett Still owned by Aaron Corbett. It was located between the town site and the Alapaha River on the south side of the Atlantic Coastline Railroad tracks. Corbett resided in Willacoochee and had a mulatto named Tom White manage the still. On the north side of the tracks was a juke joint called Mims Fish Camp and that had a nice dance floor where both whites and blacks shared in the frivolities. Not all the activities in the woods surrounding Glory were on the up and up. 
This article in the December 18, 1930 Nashville Herald reported, Last Wednesday afternoon, Chief C.B. Shaw and Deputy Sheriff Wesley Griner went over near Glory and went down in the river swamp about one mile west of Glory and found 180 gallons of corn mash. There was no still found with this buck. We all hope that Mr. Shaw will stay on here as he is doing such a good work and helping him to clean up the community by catching blind tigers. After a revival meeting was held in the community in 1915, residents organized the Glory Methodist Church. Shade Dormany donated the land for the first church. Within several months, a tall wooden structure was built that housed the Glory Methodist Episcopal Church. In the April 22, 1921 Pearson Tribune, it is recorded, there was an all-day sing at Glory, Barry, and County last Sunday. Large crowd, plenty to eat, and a general good time was the order of the day. The Glory Methodist Church originally sat on the corner of the Main Street and the road off of 82. However, in 1949, when the two main businesses closed down, the membership decided they would rather have the structure in a safer and more pleasant setting. So the Glory Church was dismantled and rebuilt up across Highway 82 onto Wycliffe Roberts Road using some of the same lumber from the original church. In 1900, John C. Tucker the primary landowner of Glory in 1900, set aside one piece of land for a one-room schoolhouse. It was at the easternmost end of Glory in the southeast corner of Landlot 426. The school was built in 1908 to 1909 and was in operation for 25 years. Over the course of a quarter century, young families of the Tuckers, Lewis, Gaskins, Hendersons, Sizemores, Moores, Coombs, Whites, Taylors, and Rows, and many more gave their children the basic first through eighth grade education. In its last year in 1933-34, it had 118 students, six were black. This is the photo of the only known image of the Glory students. When the school was closed, the students attended school in Alapaha, and the Glory School, like the rest of Glory, was torn down. Today, there is little that remains to suggest that the community of Glory was a vibrant turpentine town. The most visible landmark is the old Atlantic Coastline Railroad bed now a two-track road that appears and disappears between random stands of pine, oak, and scrub brush. Hints of a paved driveway and unidentifiable pieces of structure that once made up a mill town are scattered about. And with them, the faded memories of those who once hoped this road led to glory. <laughs> Finally, let's visit the lowest town site at the south end of Berrien County. The town was located in a deep hollow on the south side of Highway 37, about a mile east of Old Coffee Road. The signpost, when it is still standing, reads Old Lois Road. Many are familiar with what is now known as the New Lois community. It occupies most of southwest Berrien County, south of Nashville. However, it derives its name from the original commercial center of the area, identified in the 1883 Cram Railroad map of Berrien County 
as simply Lois, but later referred to as Old Lois. Exactly when the Lois village was established is not recorded. However, sometime prior to 1883, Robert K. Turner had established a post office there and named it Lois. Though the post office was discontinued in May of 1883, the name remained. The Lois community had its early beginnings with the creation of the Pleasant Primitive Baptist Church, organized in 1835, the oldest church in Berrien County. The congregation was made up of the Devane, Albritton, Webb, Fountain, Connell, Carter, Morris, Taylor, Shaw, and Parrish families. Henry J. Parrish was the early pioneer whose farm sat on the knoll adjacent to the Pleasant Cemetery. His headstone is the earliest marker in the cemetery, and his family and his slaves are buried there. In January 1898, Joseph S. Morris, pictured here, was appointed postmaster of the Lois Post Office, then replaced three months later by Ezekiel J. Williams. However, the post office was discontinued again in 1904, and mail was sent and received through the Adel Post Office. In February 1892, the Tifton Gazette announced that Goodman and Brown had opened a turpentine operation in the lowest section of Berrien County. The William E. Connell family, owners of much of the land adjacent to Connell's Pond, decided to build a shingle mill using the cypress trees cut from the pond. They dug out a large mill pond just north of the town site pouring concrete bulkheads, using cypress planks for the dam. Cypress logs were floated down Connell Creek to the pond, then cut for shingles at the mill. In addition, the dam would provide power for turning the grist mill and gin. The 1908 Hudgens map identifies several businesses in Lois. Connell's Mill, Webb Brothers Gin, Fountain Brothers Store, a Missionary Baptist Church, and the nearby residents William Hodge Albritton, W. A. Knight, Chester B. Parrish, and J. S. Carter. As early as 1903, the Cecil Lumber Company ran a tram line from Cecil up through Afton and across the Withlacoochee River then up to the growing Lois Business District. Up the hill from the hollow adjacent to today's Highway 37 on the south side in front of the Linda Butler home was the old Lois School. The Lois School was conducted as early as 1891 with 60 students in attendance. The school continued in operation annually until the consolidation of schools in 1933. The last year, its enrollment was 91 students, with 19 of them black. The students then attended the new Lois School on the old Valdosta Highway. In an April 1909 article in the Nashville Herald titled The Prosperous Community of Lois, the author wrote, Lois, although a small place, and indeed it is a small place, is one of the busiest little places in the county. The article goes on to identify the grist mill now being run by Marshall and Johnson, plus two stores run by John W. Strickland, pictured here, and H. R. Fountain. However, as prosperous as it may have seemed, the undoing of the little village was the damn idea. 
meaning the dam leaked so badly that the mill pond would not hold enough water to provide power for the grist mill or gin. There wasn't enough consistent water flow to float the logs down from Connell's pond to the sawmill, so they had to be transported by oxen and wheels. The Cecil Lumber Company saw the floundering mill operation, so by 1907 they had pulled up its tracks and ran their tram line several miles southwest of Lois to the community of Oak. The loss of the railroad link resulted in the loss of jobs, failures of the mercantile and hardware stores, and eventually the closing of the mill. The grist mill was converted to a diesel engine and for a time was operated by Robert Griffin. Finally, during the Depression years, those who had farms were able to survive, but the lowest town site became abandoned, while buildings in the old Connell Mill Pond yielded to nature's reclamation that takes place in South Georgia. However, there are still several remnants of the early pioneer structures that are visible. If you enter the old Lois town site from the south from the Pleasant Church, the original structure of the church is still there, though it is covered with aluminum siding. If you happen to attend one of the monthly Primitive Baptist meetings there, you can still view the earliest construction details on the inside of the chapel, featuring the flat plank heart pine walls and the original center post with the holes of the once used rail separating the men from the women in the services. As you continue north up the hill on Pleasant Drive, you will come to the old farm home of Joseph S. Morris, former Lois Postmaster. The structure is now a storage shed, and trees keep it mostly hidden from view. Just past the Morris home is the Pleasant Cemetery, where many of the lowest pioneers are buried. About a mile further on Pleasant Drive, the paved road curves to the right. The dirt road to the right is the old Lois Road that leads to the Bernice Peters Road and the remnants of William Lott and Georgia Peters' home. The dirt road to the left off the paved road leads to the old Lois town site. Shortly after you turn left onto the old Lois town site road, an arbor lane on the left leads to a dead end and the home place of Hodge Albritton and Susan Catherine Bird Albritton. They are among the early Lois pioneer residents. Back on the old Lois Township Road, as it leads deeper into the hollow, a dirt road to the right called Studstill Road will lead you to the W.A. Knight Farm Home. This family was also named on the 1908 map of Lois. This background photo of the W.A. Knight Place was taken in 1993. Almost 30 years later, you can see what time has done to this structure. Just another loss of Berrien history. We are now back on the Old Lois Township Road nearing the bottom of the hollow. On the right of the photo was the location of the Fountain Brothers store, and behind it up the hill was the Baptist Church. On the left was John W. Strickland's hardware store and the Webb Gin site, and beyond the bend in the road on the right was Connell's Shingle Mill. No structures exist in the hollow today. Finally, we get down to the creek bed where a wooden bridge crossed over in 1993. The background photo here is of the old Lois Dam spillway abutments, 
the dark spots on the right and left of the photo. Also, hand-hewn posts can be seen in the foreground on the right. Today, the area is completely engulfed with trees, brush, and undergrowth. The inset is Connell Creek, just before it crosses underneath the roadway. As we climb up the hill toward Highway 37, it's almost like leaving an earlier place in time. A little melancholy, I suppose, but wonder if we are moving too fast and have really gained that much when we lose so much of our history along the way. But there are more roads to travel, so please join us on our next episode of Ghost Towns of Berrien.